Good evening. I'm Pittsburgh City Councilman Daniel Lavelle. And I'm Councilman Reverend Ricky Burgess. And we welcome you back to Black Pittsburgh Matters. Black Pittsburgh Matters is a series of virtual town hall meetings affirming a citywide agenda that Black Pittsburgh does indeed matter. Black Pittsburgh Matters means that Black lives matter. We must protect the health and safety of Black people. It means that Black communities matter. We must focus on rebuilding Black communities. And it means that Black wealth matters. We must focus on increasing Black employment and entrepreneurship. The Black community has been disproportionately affected by concurrent crises. One, the COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting economic crisis. Um, and then secondly, race relations, which is a public health crisis. Normally in times of great change and in, in, in crisis, we'll be coming to you as the Black elected officials of Pittsburgh and having meetings across the city with our constituents, partners, and allies. Since we cannot do so safely in the current pandemic, we're now using this media and platform to come to you in the ways in which we can to talk about what we're doing, and discuss policy and legislation concerning Black Pittsburgh. These means will be available via Facebook, YouTube, and the city's cable channel. You can contact or ask questions via the Black Pittsburgh Matters Facebook page or email us at blackpghmatters at gmail.com. And certainly you can message us through our live feed right now. Today's town hall meeting topic is health, safety, and violence prevention initiative. This past summer, Councilman Burgess and I introduced public safety reform legislation for community violence prevention called Stop the Violence. And we funded it through the elimination of the police recruitment budget and a decrease in the total overall police budget. In doing so, we've been able to further the Group Violence Initiative, which is a nationwide program that empowers trusted community leaders to prevent violence in their communities through restorative justice and conflict resolution. In partner with the mayor, Mayor Pudigo, we also introduced the Health, Safety, and Violence Prevention Initiative. This houses the Office of Community Health and Safety, which offers comprehensive wraparound social services to those most in need, with the Office of Community Services and Violence Prevention, which tasked with community embedded violence prevention and conflict resolution. Together, these twin offices provide comprehensive, comprehensive resources to tackle um, both the social economic, social economic and personal causes of violence and hardship, thus working together, achieving the first goal of Black Pittsburgh Matters, uh, protecting the health and safety of Black people. And of course, Daniel, today people got their first look at our legislation banning the Breonna Taylor law, um, um, eliminating no-knock warrants. Yeah, um, which is critical. Obviously in city council, we held it today and we're gonna have a, a public conversation about that um, and, and why it needs support and why we need to pass it. But the legislation we passed this past summer um, that really helped to expand GVI citywide and make it a full time was really one of the, I believe, sort of prouder moments that we've had this year. Um, this city has seen a decrease in violent crime over the last few years, and it can absolutely be attributed to the work of the group violence intervention workers in that initiative and that program. And to now be able to have those gentlemen who have been working their own full-time jobs, but then dedicating their time to violence prevention, to be able to have them now have full-time job opportunities, to be able to take this citywide and have a, just a tremendous impact on our city, is something that we should be really, really proud of. Um, and shortly we'll hear from them and they'll, they can better explain what they do and how they do it. But I just wanna go on the record and publicly thank them um, for the years of service they've already put in and what they're gonna do moving forward as well. Yeah, I agree. It's if all the things that we have done, this, um, this group initiative, this group violence uh, initiative um, in public safety has been in terms of black people the lives of black people, uh, one of the most significant things that either one of us have done since we've been members of council. We are honored to be joined today by Jay Gilmer, the Stop the Violence Coordinator for the Pittsburgh Department of Public Safety, Devon Madden, President and CEO of Shadow Student Athlete Development Services, founder of Brothers of Christ, and member of the Group Violence Initiative Outreach Team, Valerie Dixon, Director of Family and Community Support 
at the Center for Victims and a long-term friend and a member of the Group Violence Initiative Outreach Team and Laura Degoski, Critical Community Manager. Um, um, welcome to this evening's Town Hall meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us, both Councilman Lavelle and Councilman Burgess. Absolutely. Thank so, you. Go ahead. No. So, to, so to begin, um, maybe if we could start with EBI since I had some remarks about it. Um, maybe Jay, if you can give us sort of a comprehensive overview of what the program is, um, how it got started. Obviously, Reverend Burgess, who was instrumental in that, can also chime in. But then after we get sort of the comprehensive overview of the program, maybe both Vaughn and, and Valerie, if you all would be willing to chime in to talk about the day-to-day -day work of it. Very good. Well, thank you very much for having me, Councilman Lavelle, Councilman Burgess. Thank you for your support over the years. Thank you for the ongoing efforts to help us to do whatever it takes to prove and to the whole world that Black lives really do matter that every bell life is valuable, that they're worth a lot, that we cannot afford to lose any more. So we really wanna thank you for that. And thanks for giving me a chance to talk about uh, our primary uh, program through the Office of Community Services and Violence Prevention, which is uh, our group violence intervention strategy. And I wanna call it a strategy rather than a program because it really is, it begins with a principle and that the and the, 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 the principle is really that the immediate cause of street violence, the immediate cause, what happens to the actual gun to get fired is basically, in, a, in the words of a New York Times article, that young men who are bored, broken armed, bored, broken armed, uh, and they're fighting over girls and pride. So with that, that's, with, that, that's what get, brings the, the yeah, that's the cultural piece of this that creates this, this this desire. I know there's all, everyone that has its own individual story, but when you begin with that, then you can re you realize that the solution is not really as complicated as we might want to make it appear. There's some underlying causes that cause people to be bored, broken armed, but, but those, are, those are not what causes the actual gun to get fired on a street corner or at night or after a party or, or in somebody's driveway. GVI, our Group Violence Intervention Strategy, is a strategy to reduce shootings and homicides in urban neighborhoods by using a three-prong strategy. Three prongs that are relatively simple to explain and to take a lifetime to perfect. The number first is a, it's a, it's a, a partnership of law enforcement with the community. For a long time, we've assumed that law enforcement can solve this problem by themselves, that if you just have enough police officers and enough corners, that'll stop it. It does. We've proven that that does not work. Uh, there is a role for law enforcement to play, of course, but it's not. They're not going to solve this problem by themselves. The second component is an is it is informed street outreach and social services to redirect high risk individuals and then thus prevent violence. When you when when you know that somebody is bored, broken armed. Uh, you know who that you know that person by name. You can speak to that person. They will usually tell you they don't want to kill anybody, they, and they don't want to be killed themselves. So if you, but you've got to be close enough to be able to have the have that conversation and to know what to do with that person once they tell you what their real problem may be. You've got to have some way to resolve a conflict. You've got to have some other way to use that time. You've got to have something else to divert that person from uh, just doing what's on his mind right now. And if you're too tired from working all day, you're not out there shooting anybody. And then the third component um, of the group finance intervention strategy is an inform our informed community members who are creating new community norms with respect to violence and actually rejecting violence as the way to solve your problems. You know, in some in most neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, if you if a, if someone is shot on the street. All neighbors, everyone within earshot of that event will hear a sound. They will call the police. They will, if they know who's involved, they will call someone. They will tell someone. They'll report it. Before that person gets back to their home, their police will be waiting for them. Some communities, that doesn't happen. 
Uh, it's not that they want to have violence, but there's there's a, a fear of calling law enforcement sometimes. Um, and there's sometimes also a, a, a fear of perpetrators because you've got now a culture that allows violence. And we've got to have, a, we've got to change that cultural norm to say violence is not the way to resolve these problems. There's something else to do. And that's, that comes from all quarters. That comes from schools, that comes from churches, that comes from community leaders, that comes from parents. Uh, it comes from all over the place. So these are the basic components of the GVI strategy. It's law for a partnership with law enforcement, and then we're also working to improve the relationships between law enforcement and community members, especially those in high-risk communities. It's informed street outreach and social services to the redirect high-risk individuals. And it's involved community members reinforcing community norms that then reject violence. When all these things start to work, then you actually start to see a change in violence. You start to see lower numbers of homicides. And hopefully at the, you know, a few years down the road, we can see uh, uniform homicide number, uniformly low homicide numbers in all neighborhoods of the city of Pittsburgh. So that's where we are right now. And I'll let uh, uh, Devon speak a little bit and I'll let Valerie speak because Valerie is one of our, is, 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 as you heard, one of our outreach team members. And she also has a lot of other spectacular work, especially on the cultural side, uh, trying to show what community members need to know, how they can react and how they can respond uh, to this uh, this uh, health public health crisis of violence. Thank you, Jay, for the introduction. I just want to thank everybody for uh, allowing me to be a part of this space, uh, be a part of the table, and to discuss the various things that we're doing over here at uh, Shadow Student Athletes. Um, Shadow Student Athletes, just give you a little bit of background about our organization. We was uh, founded in 2011 um, by myself um, and a group of other student athletes. Um, Back in the, just trying to bridge the gap between uh, student athletes and the academic support that they was having at the high school level. So when we began to build out this process, there was a bunch of student athletes and regular students that we found that needed academic support, uh, character development. So we created uh, another program called the AIM Initiative, which provides uh, culturally, uh, culturally relevant uh, mentors into urban school spaces where we uh, do mediations, interventions, uh, tons of outreach with the students from uh, kindergarten to 12th grade and, and Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, and we also have a program called Camp uh, Fun, and that's Families Unite Neighborhoods, where that's a six week summer camp on the south side of Pittsburgh that has 100 students. Um, and then last year, uh, due to COVID, we reduced the uh, camp down to 25 students. But that particular camp, we just provide uh, students with additional six weeks after school, I mean, after uh, they get out of regular school for the summertime, we do a lot of academic enrichment. We do African drumming dance. Uh, we shot two short films this summer um, and we uh, do a bunch of uh, art programming. And then we have our college readiness program called Evolve, where we're traveling around the uh, country to different universities. We have took kids to as uh, far as the USC, we went to UCLA all the way down to Florida, all the way up to Connecticut. Uh, schools there we have visit uh, Yale or Harvard so that's the, just a little background about uh, what our organization does um, if you have any questions I'm feel free to we can go a little now uh, and Devon is also part of our, our GVI outreach team uh -huh. let me just tell you a little bit about one success that we just had very recently then I'll let him talk about how he worked what how all these things tie together uh, just just yet last night one of the outreach workers on one of our teams heard that someone was upset and was ready to shoot they were, they were they started to act on that, that impulse. They mentioned to their team supervisor, who mentioned it to the GVI coordinator, the Reverend Cornell Jones, who mentioned it to the Housing Authority Police and the Pittsburgh Police, uh, who then prevented that person from carrying out, from acting out on that intention. They didn't arrest the person, but they diverted him from doing that. And now, right now, the outreach teams are trying to um, um, help those individuals so they can start doing the right stuff instead of the wrong stuff. So the key component to any of our outreach workers, outreach teams, is having individuals like Devon, who is from a neighborhood, who knows the people, who has a relationship, who's and he's close enough that he's able that he's that they were he's able to find out if someone is upset, if there is a some kind of a feud brewing that may lead to something more, uh, and. 
So that's and so that a lot of people in the community can be involved, but but they don't have to just and let us know things. But not not everybody's got the skills to do the to do the mediation part of that to actually do the 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 the, the interruption parts. So there's a role for every community member that that has a relationship to you know, let us know, and then we can take that the next step. So Devon, why don't you speak about how these out, how the outreach teams actually work that together, and how you work with the strategy? Uh, so one of the, um, what we have done recently here on the south side, we have just uh, created uh, social spaces where uh, young men and young adults can come to a space. Um, to just blow off name. So we had created a weight room um, over here on the south side. We had a particular incident with a young man got into a fight with his uncle. Um, long story short, um, the young man had a, a friend of his bring a gun to the house, trying to, you know, harm his uncle. You know, the family caught me. And just with my background, uh, me being a mediation specialist and certifying that work, I was able to intervene. Um, get the boy out of the house, talk to the uh, friends and family, mediate the, the thing on the spot, and then had a follow-up uh, intervention plan in place where we have given resources um, and outlets to the, that whole household where I go there um, every other week and just continue just to work through some of the problems and frustrations that these, the young man has, his family. We was able to come to a resolution um, with, you know, the friends and family in that situation to put it out that didn't even – Escalate, but it was at the point where it was uh, going to escalate, and then we just was able to uh, do that small intervention, also provide continued follow up. That's what it mm -hmm. takes. It takes it takes just that little bit of knowledge that you can actually intervene, and then when you have worker workers from all over the city meeting with each other, all of a sudden, almost anyone anywhere who hears about a dispute can talk to someone who might know someone on the other side of that dispute. So that's the, hence the need to increase the number of outreach workers in different neighborhoods, uh, to have people connect with lots of these sports teams, after school programs, church youth groups, and other community groups where the, where the higher risk individuals are gonna be found. Uh, Reverend Bird, you had a question. So Valerie, you and I, we go back a long way. We've both been doing this work for a long, long, I'm just thinking about that, um, long time. And so sort of give me your impression about how the work is going and sort of your expertise and um, your input, your, your insight, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Burgess. And definitely, um, you know, we've uh, been out here, you longer than I, or maybe even the same amount of time, don't know. But uh, this issue is just, you know, close to us um, as uh, individuals that lost a loved one to violence out here, you know, and I, you know, my segue into, of course, the work was, you know, losing my son, Rob Dixon, and uh, June 25th, 2001, he was murdered in the Lincoln Avenue area of Pittsburgh. And one of the things that ignited a lot of my concept of the work, when someone would ask, where did he get killed at? And I would tell somebody where, and it was almost like, oh, yeah, that happens out there. Like, you know, that was okay. Yeah, that usually happens out there. And that was, a, that was, just as painful to me as, as my own son's death to say that's how they really feel about it so what can we do like what can I do as a mother the first at the beginning was like trying to find out who killed my son which we were pretty lucky we had people come forward and I always say it was text it was textbook perfect how if there could be a perfect way of how uh, um, someone is held accountable for the harm that they've caused in my son's death you know the community came forward they gave the police officers the information that came to the crime scene, you know, sealed everything up, gave that information to the detectives. They did their investigation, gave information to DA, charges was filed, we had a trial, and the person had to pay for their crime, you know, and, um, you know, it happened so quickly for me, but I was already invested in trying to find out why these deaths are happening and there's no resolve or, um, you know, families didn't understand um the where the guns come from all those different things like that it was just so much out there that I wasn't aware of because it didn't smack me in the face ever in my life before and so on that journey it was like um how do we integrate with a process that is just not individual process so I went to a lot of meetings and you know was on a lot of committees and I said you know who's doing something like unilaterally throughout the city. You know, we had a great program project over there and a good one over there, but how are we combining the work together? So it's unilaterally, it's just like, um, you know, I mentioned earlier in a conversation with uh, Jay, you know, you have to address this issue 
unilaterally, just like you're looking at COVID, okay? You can't like solve COVID in this community, but not that community because it's still going to spread. So how can we all be doing something at the same time and partnership? So um, when this initial program GVI has now, Group Balance Intervention, was almost kind of emulated from a previous program the city of Pittsburgh had, I thought it was a no-brainer. You know, all three tiers, if they're working together, we can impact the um, the issue of homicide because one of the things about GBI is address the homicide rate specifically those that are prone to kill or prone to be killed. You know, how do we reach them, and then how do we do that by building relationships with the communities that we're in and those individuals with organizations like Vaughn and organizations like a lot of our collaborative partners. These are young people that are not young people, all of us, <laughs> but we have a relationship within our community. So uh, we already almost have a door open for that conversation, that dialogue to happen. That was a plus to me. Like if somebody is open to hear at least what I have to say, that's the beginning of saving a life. And so how do we build on that? Okay, where's the provider services that they need? They say, oh, I need a job. I need a driver's license. Oh, I can't get this. I need that. That's why I'm out there in the street. Okay, we got this organization that can help you with that. Has that been the problem? Anything else we can help you with? And then somebody could almost slightly case manage it, but the family is in support of it too. So you engage the family as well too, because a lot of those issues, some of them do stem from the family, you know, or it could be intergenerational, different things like that. But um, the part that I brought, that I felt that myself um, was invited in on was the connection that I had with other mothers that had a loss within the community and wanted to do something and utilize their voice to try to have a young person change their mind. And so how do we pull these moms together to have an impact in uh, some of these um conversations, some of these dialogues, some of these mediations. And a lot of times young people will listen to a mom that lost a loved one to violence, you know, and that kind of opens the door and gets, gets them like to say, you know, I want my mother to end up where you are, or, you know, or my grandmother to feel this way, or my guardian, whoever that person is that love you, you know, we, we share that message of love. You know, we love you and we want you to live, you know, to me it's so important on uh, my side of things when I share about my son's story, when they killed him, they killed our last name. Like, you know, there's no lineage after my son's death and he didn't have a chance to make kids. They have children. And so it's like, our lineage is extinct. Like think of a dinosaur, they're no longer here anymore. You know, that's like the Dixons. When they killed my son, that was it. Can you imagine no more lineage after you're here, you know, and what that would, the impact of that would be to your family, to a culture. So we get like real deep and heavy with our piece, the mothers that we bring in when we want to go to um, outreach to a family, you know, that uh, really feel that their child is in trouble and want us to help. And um, the partnership and the resources that we collab that collaboratively have surrounding us with all of the guys and gals that are involved in GVI, it makes it uh, a stronger enforcement of, of our message, of the message as a, as a whole. We want you to live, we love you. And uh, we, we're sorry we dropped the ball on you whatever it might have been growing up to make you feel that killing somebody else will validate your life. But there's other ways we, you can validate your life, you know? And so, you know, it's a different messaging that we all have, but we bring, everybody brings something special to the table, but we all work together collectively to make it happen. So I, I'm excited about the work and it's very, um, it's very intense and daunting. And I connected with uh, the Center for Victims, you know, um, being the director of Family and the Community Support, which is an ad hoc uh, unit that they just developed in the last few years because they, you know, because they are funded by a certain funding stream that limits certain abilities for us to reach out to kids on the other end. You know, it's like victim, 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 but we know it's full circle. If you don't help the victim and the offender in the community, then you're just going to keep having that circle. So how do we tap into each one of them without violating, staying in compliance, and so the partnerships with GVI and the PACT initiative, my um, Unsolved Homicide Billboard campaign and, you know, um, Vaughn's program and a lot of our collaborative partners program, that allows us to extend our branches a little further to be able to help provide services to these young people. Let them know that we, we got something for you. You know, we don't, we don't want to lose you. We don't want to lose you. Yes, we so, see that the role of the parents. I want to, um, 
I wanted to go to Laura um, in terms of she is now the, um, you know, the new head of the, um, the, the Office of Community Health and Safety, which I think helps to bring overall resources in a sort of structural way to not this, this program, but to multiple programs, homelessness programs, other programs. And so Laura, I, I guess I, I'd like for you to kind of talk a little bit about um, the vision you are tasked with being sort of its, sort of its first head and, and getting it up and running and is doing programming now, but give us a sense of what it is, what you hope to do and some of the things you're doing right now. Thank you, Reverend Burgess, and thank you, Councilmember Lavelle, and, and to Jay and the um, and Ms. Dixon, Mr. Madden. Um, I think we're learning a lot from the GVI work every day, uh, and that's because um, what you are, have spoken about, and I know Reverend Burgess and Councilmember Lavelle, you've talked about this with you know the uh, Dr. Gloucester and Dr. Larkins Pettigrew is something about trust and relationships. Uh, where we sit now there are a lot of people in the community who lack trust or relationships of systems and services that we, we say are going to help them. We say are going to be essential. Uh, and we don't just get to show up and say, well, now you have to trust us, right? People trust is earned. Trust is built. Trust doesn't come because you say it should. Um, so the, the, the new office community health and safety, uh, was born out of this idea that the, the community members, that people who have experiences, that people with who work with community members, they know best. Uh, it's not a person sitting at a desk. It's not a person who read a, a really excellent book, although they might have read a really excellent book. But the idea is that the lived experience of the direct service and the individuals in our communities is, is what uh, needs to be elevated. And, and that extends to public safety. Public safety, our, our professionals in public safety see a lot. Uh, and we need to listen to them. And we need to understand how we take it from what they've seen and what they've experienced to systems change. So the Office of Community Health and Safety is, is focused, as you said, Reverend Burgess, just on that, on health and safety, with particular focus on community members who have been harmed, you know, who have been in the carceral systems, who have um, been failed by educational or health systems. We want to prioritize those individuals first because, frankly, th that's what equity is, right? That's where we failed to meet those needs. Um, so the Office of Community Health and Safety for, first focuses on what we call building a continuum of support. So there are some good services, there are some good partners, there are people who are doing their part and are doing excellently. Where are things not going well? And what is the responsibility of the city? And what this is the responsibility of other partners? Someone walks out of a particular institution in the middle of the night and they're homeless and they use drugs and they don't have anywhere to go. It's very likely that they're gonna see police, but if we had set that individual up with the supports before they left that institution to the degree that GBI does this, right? We don't want you to ever even know something bad could happen. There are a lot of people doing the work, getting in there, working with the individual to say, we're not even going to let that happen. So building this continuum of support that says, what's early intervention? What is the way that, that we get to something before it's a crisis? What is that very pre-crisis space? What is in the moment? So, you know, um, I know one of the officers said to me, they've been called for cases like a, a, a kid isn't eating their broccoli. We don't need officers there. That's not for officers. So what, do we, what other partners can be on scene who are trusted, who the community is asking us to come? And then what's a stabilization look like? So after a situation has occurred, and I know Ms. Dixon said she works for Center for Victims who do a lot of those services post-traumatic post event, how do we stabilize people so it doesn't happen again and again? So we wanna build that up. And some of the programs we've already started to work with, Foundation of Hope, we're looking at diversion programs. And I know Jay is very familiar with those as well. So I wanna kick that to him when, if, if we wanna get in more depth there. But that's looking at saying, we don't need people to get into the criminal justice system to get help. If someone needs help, we get them help. We don't put them in jail and hope that they're gonna get help in jail. Um, we're working with Allegheny Health Network and what we're trying to do, and that, that was largely born out of an effort to understand what homelessness looked like in Homewood. Because we knew that there was homelessness in Homewood, but for whatever reason, there wasn't data. And we needed to say, okay, if, if, if data was gonna take, people are gonna find that out. So the Allegheny Health Network team was developed not to, not to replicate the services that are there, but to say, hey, um, you know, Ms. Dixon has a relationship with someone. Ms. Dixon can call the Allegheny Health Network team and say, this guy needs housing. And they can help to do that legwork and that back work and get that served right up. 
or if that person wants to talk and work with them, they can work with them. But it's, it's, not, it's about the trust in the relationship. So there's no desire to go in and take people out of a relationship or what feels safe to them, but rather to say, GVI, you're doing excellent work. What do you need? How do we continue to support the excellent work you do? Or Center for Victims, you're doing excellent work. How do we continue to support it? So we're not looking at recapitulating what exists. We're saying, how do we shore it up? Uh, so, you know, those are our two kind of early early initiatives. We're also looking at training public safety. We need them to understand the impact of their experiences with the community. You know, they may think of it as just a charge. That person may lose their kids over that charge. And it is, it is, a, it's nothing. They're not going to get help for it. They're not going to get services. They're not going to get support and they're going to have their, their family destroyed. So what does it look like to change the paradigm and say, how do we support you? How do we help you? So, you know, that's where we're, the most important part of all of this is that the community knows what they need. They will tell us what safety looks like. They will tell us what trust looks like. We do not need to tell them, oh, instead of sending an officer, we're going to send an officer and a social worker. Well, is that what you want? Is that, is that what people want? Maybe somebody does. Maybe some people do. And maybe some people don't. And we don't want to just take a poll, say we got it, and, and, and do it. We want to have it be kind of iterative. We try something, people say it's not working. Stop it. This isn't right. Thank you. That's the best information we could get. We're not going to throw good effort after bad. We're going to try something different and we're going to adapt. So that's, you know, it's building that continuum of support. It's intervening as early as possible so that we do the least harm to people. We want people to thrive. We don't want them to just have, you know, a, a, a unit and a, a, a basic subsidy so that they can get groceries. Like people, we want people to thrive. And that's of course, a lot of the work that everyone's doing too around these real upstream investments in the community. So, you know, um, we're right now in the process of, of getting jobs up. So a lot of what we're doing is, is gonna grow over the next year. And uh, I, I welcome any opportunity to uh, partner and, and learn from you all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if you could also just take a brief moment and tell us how the two offices work together and how they complement one another, meaning the offices of community health and safety and community services violence prevention. How do, the, how do they actually work together and complement one another? It's a really good question. And, um, you know, I want to compliment uh, Assistant Director Shatara Murphy, who is, is so excellent in public safety and, and works very closely with the group violence intervention teams with Jay and, and Reverend Jones. Uh, so Director Murphy, Assistant Director Murphy will oversee the Office of Community Services and Violence Prevention. And in addition to the violence prevention work, which is already ongoing and continues to be strengthened, work around nighttime economy, work around stop the violence with Jay, work around the, the community engagement piece that Jay and John work on. And Jay, I'll, I'll probably kick over to you because I'm going to park rangers. I mean, that, that office has so much in terms of how we serve the community, how we build the relationships. And of course, you know, Director Murphy's uh, leadership is excellent there. But on the community health and safety point part, we're trying to look at uh, what are the services and supports that go beyond the violence prevention piece? So our violence prevention intervention workers identify someone who has unmet needs and they need substance use treatment and they need mental health supports or they need uh, housing. Not only do we want to be able to make those services available to people with experts, right, with the experts who navigate those systems, because those are experts who the people who do uh, housing case management, that is an expertise and we want to go to the expert. And so we're not going to try to make a violence prevention intervention staff member into a case manager, into a, a housing case manager, into a peer recovery specialist, into, into, because that's where we are with police. We've asked police to do a lot of stuff that they are not expert in. And instead we need to go to the experts. So we want to be able to find what are the resources and supports that our community members need? How do we complement the excellent work of GVI, of Stop the Violence, of all of these initiatives? And then uh, to another degree, when those services aren't responsive, when they're not showing up, there's, a, there's an advocate in Philadelphia and he said this and I've always appreciated it. He said, uh, people aren't service resistant, services are people resistant. So when a, we find that a service is not meeting the needs of our community members, then we as a city, we as a city government is 3,600 people strong and unified, go back and say, we need better. Our community needs better. People can't wait on a waiting list for this, that, or the other thing for eight months. Because all those eight months, they're sitting outside. They're sick. They're dying. We can't wait. 
So what this office is really intended to do is focus on some of this first responder implemented public health type interventions. How do we prevent harm? To support outreach staff who are doing homeless outreach, who are GBI, we have a, a, you know substance use related supports. How do we support them to make sure that they're getting services to the people that they work with? How are we also making sure to fortify and sustain community members who maybe haven't been in long-term crisis and need more meaningful placements with services? But it's, you know, the this is, a, there's a, a, a relationship piece to both. And so that's the key element and that we will rely on the trusted relationships that each have and complement one, one another in the services that are provided. Okay. Um, yes. We are... Um, you and I have been doing this long enough uh, to see um, the evolution of our work. Um, when we first started the work, the police budget has always hovered somewhere around $100 million. And we had to argue in order to get um, $350,000 to start doing this work, where the, you know, the police could get $5, $20 million without even a conversation. And since all of the protests that have happened over the summer, uh, for the first time now, there's really a, a real conversation about what reimagining the police looks like and putting money into prevention services, which wasn't there before. I guess my question, though, is do you still hear that, right? Uh, a friend of ours, uh, Aaron Dalton, congratulations, Aaron, is now the new director of, of the county's Health and Human Services, and our friend, and I'm, 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 I'm very proud of her, and, and she's one, of course, who is a, a great friend of GBI, but my, my, my question to you really is, what do you say to those people who say, well, that's not the job of the city. The job of the city, that's the county's job, do human services. The job of the city is to get a big police force and the more police you have, the safer the community is gonna be. Well, my answer to that is that it's all of our job. Everyone has a responsibility in this space. Um, there is more than enough work for everyone to do. I mean, there's, we don't need to do education, but there's a role for the schools to play in this role. We don't need to do what the county does, but there's a role for the county in this work. There's, there's a role for the police. We need police too. We don't want to not have police. We want to have the police. They've got a role to play, but they don't want to go to someone's house because their kid didn't want to go to school or because they didn't eat broccoli or they didn't want to go to bed at night. Or then they don't, they don't have, are not all that excited about uh, just um, rousing around homeless people because they just have, no place to go then what if it's not the police have no tools for that they we're putting them in a bad position and that's what we should not be doing uh so right now we do have the opportunity to do i think far more than we ever have before and i think that the, what we, the reason we've seen some success is because we have been consistent with a strategy for the sets for for so 12 years we have not started and stopped when valerie was working with this team and so was Ron way back when and now, and we're still doing basically the same thing. The answer has not really changed, but the but the, not the motivation to do it has changed, and the funding sources have changed. And now we're able to to go far beyond where we ever have been before. So that now uh, we will work with the county, we will work with the schools, uh, and we're going to add on more things that we can do to bring our own people together to create a greater sense of community, which is why we have many, many ways for community members to engage with this work right now, including our Stop the Violence newsletter, which can be signed up for um, by anybody, anybody, anywhere. We have our new volunteer prayer team because we need to engage churches. We have volunteer faith councils coming. And some of this is also in partnership with the public, the Bureau of Police. Um, we have Mad Dads who's interested in being a part. We've got our public safety councils in every single police zone in the city. We have a trauma response team that the Neighborhood Resilience Project runs. And all these things, we've got a, some great training videos. We'd love more community members to watch. They can really see and get a, can really feel how important this, this it, the, the, our strategy is, our approach is, your mindset is. To know that every, there's a role for every individual in this space. If you're a mom, if you have a child, if you know a child, if you're their neighbors to a child, if you're or know someone who's troubled in any way, there's a role for you to play. Now, our, and our job is to make it easier for you to find the help that you know someone needs. So it's not so difficult. Laura, what do you think? Do we, should we be putting money into services? So 
I think that we know that we're not the Department of Human Services. They do excellent work. They have a huge volume of services to do. I agree with Jay, though, that it's everybody's responsibility, particularly to in the city, that we need to care for our residents. And when we see some, you know, when you see something, say something. When we see that there are gaps, and not just, I mean, you know, the thing that I keep reminding myself is we talk in these terms of there's a gap or there's an issue. And, you know, maybe maybe Valerie can speak to this greater than I can. A gap means someone might die. You know, a gap means someone is sleeping outside and might be assaulted. And I think it's very easy to, to deal in terms of um, metrics, data metrics. But when you do the direct service and you work with an individual who is uh, str suffering, struggling, that gap is not something that can be talked about in a, you know, air quote gap. That is someone's life. And so I think, you know, what we need is to be able to demand a high level of accountability, whether it is us providing it, you know, and that is what we seek from our fire police EMS park rangers, whether it is GVI pro providing those services or whether it's, a, you know, whether it's office community health and safety staff or whether it is a, a, a partner, because if they're not, then it's incumbent upon us to advocate for our residents and say this is unacceptable. We will not sit back and watch people live in, a, you know, abandoned buildings where they're subject to extreme potential harm and not point to it and say this is happening this isn't this isn't just and it's not acceptable we're not going to you know we're not going to tolerate this anymore so you know I, I i would defer to valerie to say uh who what the impact is but i don't think that the city cannot do it uh because either we either we don't hire these individuals and we don't contract these programs to do this work or we keep hiring officers and as jay said Officers are not appropriate for these situations. They know it. They tell us all the time. So anyways, I, I, I do think that, I guess, very impassioned, yes, I think we do need to provide these services. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. And when, we, when, when I always hear, um, you know, the gap or, you know, somebody dropped the ball or something like that, I know living in a city of bridges, you know, basically all it is is like we have to make the connections with the bridge. You know, we have we have to be the bridge builders, all of us. And so how do we have, like, if we're engaging with someone, you know, we don't immediately have all that information in front of us of what they actually need. Or is it a way to create a database for that and say, hey, group violence intervention has this database for, you know, you have the different topics or sections, you know, this person needs the driver's license, this person needs a place to live, this person, you know, is homeless or whatever it is. And you could just click on that and like, boom, here's your services right there. And you'll be like, I'll get back to you, you know, by then you get six more cases you got to deal with and you can't get back to them. So what would be an expedited way to get, you know, those that information too, because we don't have to keep Invent a will. There's enough programs out here, you know, that, that we don't have to keep creating more programs. We have to make, build the bridge so we can get that information to those people that need those services immediately. Because later you'll hear some stuff later. If you hear, you know, I've been a victim advocate in court for, you know, my, my 20 years at the Center for Victims, at least the last 18 years. And every time um, I did mostly homicide cases and I would hear like the history you know, of that young person that did pick up that gun and kill somebody. And then people would say, well, I didn't even know they were going through that at that time. I could have, I should have, or this program was right around the corner. That type of stuff is a dollar, a day late and a dollar short. You know what I mean? And so, you know, we know that these services are out here. It's about building that bridge and make it a way that we can expedite this information to people so that it's not these gaps and people don't drop the ball because just like police officers, you know, they go to one shooting and they try to gather that information for that shooting. And there's another one two hours later that they got to refocus on. And so there's some things that might get, you know, missing or not even missing, but, you know, delayed in a sense. And that delay, like you said, Laura, costs lives. So after we made the announcement, um, about funding these initiatives. I had a gentleman come up to me in the hill um, who said, hey, look, I heard about what you all are doing. Um, I had some rough patches in my past, but I'll turn my life around. I would like to get involved. Can either of you, and we can start with you, Ms. Dixon, if you would like to, Jay or Vaughn can also chime in. If someone wants to get involved with GVI and participate, how do you actually sort of select 
the interrupters that are that are working with GVI, and what can someone do to actually get engaged? Let me let me start with that. Start on the answer to that question. Number one, there is role. There's a role for anyone. I mean, it's there's lots. Most roles are not going to be paid roles, but there's roles for every every citizen who's doing anything. So if you've got if you have a story to tell, we want to help tell that story ourselves. We don't. Our platform is still being created, but we one of the things we are working on is how to get people like that to tell their story. We need to collect those stories because they're important. That's why, that's what will affect people's lives because if they hear a story, as so we need to tell that story. Uh, there are some up there, the paid opportunities are gonna be through our GVI uh, outreach contracting organization, organizations. And so the best way to get started with, for him is to reach out probably to me and then we can try to start connecting him starting to get him more knowledge about where we are, what we're doing, and how he might get himself involved because there's definitely a role, um, even, a, even a small connection with the group, even a volunteer connection with the outreach teams can be helpful because you could, again, it, it's about building the relationships. Once you have the relationships, then you can spend, when you know who to call, who will pick up your, who will answer your text or pick up that phone, when you know that someone is, is, is upset about something. Well, another one of the tools that we're working on is what I'll, what I'll uh, call the squash the beef hotline or disputer. So if you hear about some, some community members that have a, a feud with each other, call it in, let somebody know. That's so we can let the right, find the right interrupter in enough time that we can deal with it. Um, we also, there's a training video on the Pittsburgh Black, the Black Pittsburgh Matters um, a Facebook page right now uh, right next to the the video from this of this broadcast that has a does a, it's the beginning of a training video that we had and we have a longer version of it that we want we want potential outreach assistance uh, people to help with to watch to watch we want them to help watch this video because it does get it does talk about the strategy and and how simple some of this really is if you're focused and you have the resources you and you know where to look so what that's that way I would, but I'd say, please get in touch with us because we want to know of anyone who's got a story to tell, who's got a dollar to spend, who's got a, an opportunity to offer, and who wants it to be a, been a positive influence on the on the violent situation in the city of Pittsburgh. There is there we know that you guys were involved with some dramatic interven, intervention activity with some feuds going on with some uh, some uh, individuals that are some on the south side and some of some other neighborhoods. And we just want you to, to let the, the viewers know just how this, how you all are, what, what you're able to do and how it really works. Um, one of the things that took place over the summer was definitely a few community uh, shootings, uh, things that take place. But the, our position that we do have in some of these communities and inside the, uh, some of the public school uh, the institutions allows us to have a pulse on the community. And what we was able to do is just share information when we heard of the violence that was per take, uh, taking place uh, this summer. We was able to make a direct connection with um, family members, uh, one of the young men's father, and able to uh, get a hold of um, individuals before things uh, went to the next level and was able to, once again, put in some uh, small strategies in place. Um, two of the young men that we was able to uh, find job placement, um, and uh, once they got you know employed, you know, working, you know, 19, 18 years old, you work in a full work day. Um, they have not, you know, been in no more violence. Names kind of been, you know, faded away from, you know, some of the community um, negativities that they were getting involved in. And now that they have uh, gained for employment and program opportunities, they've been able to, uh, you know, just continue life, not as normal, um, of course, because there's still, you know, conversations and things of that nature, but haven't been you know engaged in any violent activities since they was you know gainfully employed for the last uh ooh, it's been about seven months now that they was able to maintain their job that's that's what we're here to do and i don't know i've mentioned a lot about young men but there's also young women in this mix as well unfortunately several young women have been shot this year uh we know that you know the domestic violence is a problem and some part of it's related but but it's also the, a culture uh, that and there's some cultural issues that we want to do. I'm going to ask Valerie in just a minute just to speak a word about that. But we know that uh, the the board broken armed guys are hanging around with the with with the girls, 
and the, so that they, it infect, they infect each other with the same conditions. And if, and, and if girls don't want to put up with it and they tell their guys to stop, oftentimes the guys are going to stop because the guy wants to get the girl. So there's a role they can play as well. But if they get infected with the same disease, then they, then they just perpetuate the disease. And in fact, they sometimes make it even worse because now they get it, they make feuds even larger. So what, any comments on that, Valerie, and how we deal with that? Well, you know, I know um, working at the center and um, doing a lot of the curriculum training on trauma, unaddressed trauma, compound complex trauma, a lot of these young ladies gravitate to um, these guys in the community to show, I guess, in a sense, their strength and power is either the drug dealer, you know, they got all the money or the, the ones that most people fear and things like that. And, you know, um, um, unfortunately, because we do have a high rate in our culture and our African-American families of about, I believe it's about 70 percent, if I'm not wrong, you have to quote me on that or don't quote me on that, but um, of a uh, Black families, you know, the uh, are growing up as single parent families. And so uh, the role model of a father is not really in place a lot, you know. And so what they see on the outside emulates what they feel, you know, that mate should look like or that father figure or that man in their life should look like. And so depending on some past history that these young ladies bring with them, you know what I mean? They can be easily swayed by some of these guys because they are, I mean, you know, they, they got the street smarts and they know how to say it and then they know how to sway it. And so, you know, they can work their way in. A lot of these ladies own a house or the apartment or the property that they live in. So uh, a lot of these guys don't have their own homes and apartments, you know, and so, you know, they wiggle their way into their lives. And once they're, you know, sort of in, whether either these young ladies have their child or, you know, um, you know, it's a deep and better relationship that they rely on, they get caught up. And then they get caught up in the game, you know, and then the next minute, you know, they're allowing them to hide the drugs and hide the gun there. And, you know, they're lying for them and different things like that. And it's the cultural buildup that happens. And then when something happens, when someone, you know, gets hurt, shot or killed, um, you know, then it's, uh, you know, why did this happen to my daughter? You know, she's a good girl or, you know, uh, if she wasn't with him or it was her fault because she was dealing with that dude first. And now it's this dude. So that whole cultural piece that, brings that into some communities that are deep embedded into that activity as, as it's spreading it out into other areas, of course, you know, with um, gentrification and different things like that. But one of the things that we're trying to definitely identify with, and unfortunately COVID slowed down a lot of us being able to reach these young people on a face-to-face one-on-one, but it, you know, the virtual, the virtual uh, technology is allowing us to re-engage with these youth. It's trying to help them identify their behaviors. It's not like you're a bad person, you're a horrible person, this, that, and the other. Something has happened to you in your life. The, the paradigm has happened for you to start to make these bad decisions, you know, and you need to get back to that pain that you're covering up, however you're covering it up in a relationship by drugs or whatever it is. Go back and visit, revisit that pain and identify. That's why I started doing this. My father got killed two years ago, you know, a mother would be like, oh yeah, I remember his grades did start going down at that point. Like those little, those simple things that we don't catch early, you know, we got to share that language with them now to understand when somebody understands that there's not something, I, I'm not a bad person, a bad kid. It was like Jay said, when you talk to most of them one-on-one, very intelligent young people, a lot of them, you know what I mean? I mean, from, you know, art to, you know, um, just the capability of, of knowledge that they can absorb and very smart. But then when they're in, out there in the street, they do get caught up or they get forced into something because crowd says, you know, if you hang, either you with us or you against us, you against us, it's going to happen to you. Or you with us, you we will protect you, you know? And so, you know, trying to break some of those norms all is, is some of the ways that, you know, we try to reach them on that other level, that sensitivity level. And, knowledgeable level that so, we're and that's why this is also a cultural phenomenon we've got to change the culture we got to be step to start promoting every achievement every no matter how small no matter when it begins so that you know you are valuable you've got more to offer than that you're not just what they what they say you are on tv or in some songs that you have a value to all of us so that uh, so we cannot lose you. You think your your goal in life is to live there at age twenty five? That's not a good enough goal. That's that that might have been a good enough goal in the fifteen hundreds, but that's not a good enough goal in the two thousand twenties. Your your goal is to live to hundred years old, and when we should be making those plans 
to live to 100 years old as well. So we do need everybody, every institution to help us in some way. Just, just stay abreast of the facts, just understand the facts and just see the, the connectedness of these, all these systems uh, because they have combined to cause this, the culture that is as, as, uh, as one side as warped as it seems to be today. And we're trying, we are working against that. Um, our role is, a, is a, just a part of that but there's lots of other roles to play at every, every employer. If everyone has got a job to offer or, a, or a see it in the school, we want you to call us because we want to connect you with someone. Uh, we're looking forward to expanding the things that we've been able to do so that we can have more, more relationships with more individuals in more places. So we can find out about more disputes and we can stop them so we can, so that we can uh, direct more people to, to services. I mean, we, and so the, the, the more, to, more people to, Mentor. It's important that a mentor is just unbelievably critical, even though they may oftentimes usually unpaid, usually totally volunteer. Sometimes you miss out, miss it. It's sometimes boring, but any kind of opportunity to interact with uh, younger people and start changing that culture, to start providing that incentive for someone to do well, to give the, the and someone to really know what's going on in someone's life. You can really understand don't assume that somebody knows not, uh, knows how to behave, knows how to tie a tie, knows how to say they say thank you, knows how to eat at a at a, a, a tablecloth, a restaurant with a tablecloth on it. Don't assume that. Don't assume that they know how to dispute, how to solve their dispute without shooting somebody. No, don't assume that. You could you can be the mentor that leads that person uh, to to learning some of these things. So don't be afraid to, to be that mentor because there's a role, whether it's through a church, whether it's through uh, Big Brothers, whether it's through Amachi, where there's organizations all over that could use those volunteers. And we want to know there's lots for everybody to do. So towards that end, um, the hour is upon us, but Micah Campbell Smith has been monitoring questions that have been coming in online. So I want to bring her on camera and ask that she asked one or two of the sort of top questions that have come in. Hi, so we have a question from Phyllis who said, I attended the wake and funeral of a 32 year old who was shot 17 times a week ago this past Saturday. I am certain that his family could use some support. Three to four weeks ago, coming out of a corner store in Middle Hill, I came across several liters of blood on the sidewalk and I found out two men were shot. What is being done to determine what is going on in the black community? Well, first of all, we are praying for the family of the victim. Um, every loss of life, every wounded person hurts us all. Um, we are doing a variety of things. This is a part of it. Certainly this, which you see is the violence reduction part. We're also trying to build more affordable housing. We're trying to get jobs. We're trying to really strengthen families in the black community rebuild black communities, the avenue of hope. Um, just, just a variety of, of things. Um, but to be honest with you, um, I too heard, I, you know, I, I look, you know, we were able to build new housing in Homewood. And I drive down, I look at it, I've seen um, them have birthday parties and the princess outfits. And I'm, I'm very proud that would have happened, you know, just a few years ago. But then I can drive just two or three blocks away from the new development and still see areas of great need and trouble. So we, no matter how hard we work, um, it did not take, we did not get in this situation quickly. It's going to take sustained investment over a long period of time to really change the fabric of African-American communities. Let me add on that if, the, if there is, if that, if um, that's, this uh, person asking the question does know the fit of the family, um, we do have a trauma team that can, that can, help to re re remediate any traumas uh, from neighbors or family members, please reach out. Uh, we do have outreach team members who would have be, be, be very happy to, be, to stop by. I mean, we do, we, we definitely track, we try to respond to, uh, but they, they, there's a lot of other work to be done on the inner healing side as well. I mean, we do our, the purpose of the outreach worker is to gather the general intelligence about what's going on in the community. We can't know everything, but we, we, we can know a lot and can prevent a lot. But when things do happen, we need someone like you to reach out to us 
let us know who's there. We can get the we can get our trauma team there. We can get our outreach workers there just to reinforce, re, re, reassure the family that people do care and that we and we don't want them to have to go that this cycle to repeat it through that family. So we it, it, it's definitely worth getting some attention to that family. If we can help us in any way, Micah, we love that. Another one is what can viewers do to make a difference and empower themselves to help build relationships and prevent violence in, in their community? And I believe this was uh, directed at uh, Ms. Dixon and, and Mr. Madden. Uh, I, I could start off by saying, um, you definitely do have to have a passion for helping others. Um, sometimes the overwhelming impact of all these crime, all the crime and violence that we see, we want to get involved. And then um, we do have some people that get involved, but that don't really realize how heavy it is. So if you're already carrying some stuff, you know, you might want to work on your own stuff first, you know, before you dive in, because you could cause more harm than not. But if you are past that level, you know, you can reach out like uh, Jay said, you know, reach out to GVI and see how you can get involved. Reach out to, I know I'm the um, vice chair of VPEP, which we do the Coalition Against Violence. And uh, we created a document that has 833 strategies. They always ask me because I counted every one of them. But there's 833 strategies in that document of anyone from A to Z that can get involved. And you just look in your area of expertise or interest or concern and you can say, hey, I think I'd like to work on some of this. I'd like to work on this project or this program. Or, you know, bring this to my job and say, hey, what can we do to reduce violence or intervene? Or, you know, take it to your church or say, you know, what can we do? What are we doing here? You know, and so there's like the baby steps that you can do to get started and, and um, just help it grow. And if you need some support, you can continue to reach out. But definitely there, there's definitely ways out there to reach out. And then, uh, yeah, um, I just... Uh... We'll piggyback off of what Ms. Ditcher said. Uh, she made some very great valid points. Um, and that's what I would just do is just get in contact with, you know, local community organizations and just, you know, talk to those uh, local leaders, executive directors, grassroots organizations, and just pretty much ask where's the need and just ask it. And I think that's a lot of times where uh, it's the simple question is just, hey, where can I help? And as long as your expertise whatever field you may come from background. And like she says, just making sure that she's ready for the work. Sorry, Mr. Absolutely, no, no, fine. thank you for that. Join, join, the, join the Mad Dad team, we love to have you. And what I will also just add is we'll be, we're, we will be more than willing to add all that information to our public sites um, so people can access it. Um, if you're trying to access any of the documents, Ms. Dixon or anyone else mentioned, any of those documents, feel free to reach out to myself or Reverend Burgess and we'll make sure we get that information to you and those documents to you. Um, with that being said, I do wanna thank everyone um, for being with us this evening. We have come upon our hour and our time is up. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for participating in today's show. Specifically, I wanna thank our guest, Jay Gilmer of the Stop the Violence Coordinator for the Pittsburgh Department of Public Safety. Devon Madden, President and CEO of Shadow Student Athletic Development Services and founder of Brothers of Christ and a member of the Group Violence Initiative Outreach Team. And I wanna thank Valerie Dixon, Director of Family and Community Support at the Center for Victims and a member of the Group Violence Initiative Outreach Team. And lastly, Laura Dragowski, our Critical Communities Manager. Um, we are fighting every single day to ensure our communities are safe. In order to have significant investment in the black community, it's imperative that we collectively work together to ensure our communities are safe and peaceful. And by collectively working together, we will be ensuring that we'll be able to rebuild black communities for Pittsburgh um, that are safe, prosperous, and we'll do so in conjunction with our partners and allies. I want to thank all of you for watching and participating in this town hall meeting. Remember, you can watch this show on Facebook, the city's YouTube channel, or the city's cable channel. A new meeting occurs every Wednesday. Um, by working together, united in purpose, we can transform our city, strengthen it for all of its residents. Pittsburgh can only be a city for all when it becomes a city where Black Pittsburgh matters. Stay safe, good evening, and be blessed.